Good morning. Pastor Cheryl Taylor is on vacation this week. I'm Alice Hernandez, and I'm the manager of clinical pastoral education for Parkland Hospital. And in the name of our creator and redeemer and sustainer, I welcome you to worship at First Presbyterian Church of Rockwall. As we open worship, I invite you to hear these words of grace from Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 8, verses 1 through 4. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has yet has set you free from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do, by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and to deal with sin. He condemned sin in the flesh, so that the just requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk, not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Thank you for choosing to join us for this service of worship on the 15th Sunday of Ordinary Time. We have emailed PDFs of the hymn following the sermon today, Take My Life, to those on our distribution list and posted those PDFs on our Facebook page. We invite you to sing along in your homes. You are invited to post your prayer request today in the comments section of our Facebook feed so that the community may lift up your concerns. Thanks to everyone who contributed and made our Helping Hands Pantry Drive a success yesterday. And a special thanks to our volunteers who stood out front for two hours and collected all of the items that are being donated in celebration of Sherry Ham's long years of faithful service. Erica and Joel Nanis will be taking your donations to Helping Hands tomorrow. Now, let us pause, let us invite the Spirit's presence, let us worship God. Let us pray. O oh God, you are the creator and sustainer of all life, giver of all good gifts, great and small. You are the very source of our being. You know our struggles, and we come to you, to your texts, hoping for encouragement. We draw near to you so that our lives are renewed, our spirits sustained, and our hearts warmed. Center us now on you, fully present to hear your good word. May we encounter you in new and fresh ways so that our actions line up with our proclamations that your kingdom has come. We pray, amen. Our text today comes from the 13th chapter of Matthew, verses 31 through 53. He put before them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed that someone took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of all the seeds, but when it has grown, it is the greatest of shrubs and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed in with three measures of flour until all of it was leavened. The kingdom of heaven is like treasures hidden in a field which someone found and hid, then, in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. On finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and caught fish of every kind. When it was full, they drew it ashore, sat down, and put the good into baskets, but threw out the bad. So will it be at the end of the age. The angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous 
and throw them into the furnace of fire where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Have you understood all this? They answered, yes. And he said to them, therefore, every scribe who has been trained for the kingdom of heaven is like the master of a household who brings out of his treasure what is new and what is old. When Jesus had finished these parables, he left that place. The word of the Lord. title of today's sermon is, A Statement is Not Enough. As tensions flared around the country after George Floyd's death under a policeman's knee, protesters received support from an unexpected corner, corporate America. Companies like Nike, Twitter, and Citigroup have aligned themselves with the Black Lives Matter movement. This was a surprise. This was unusual because major companies are often wary of conflict, especially in a polarized time. Major companies tend to be afraid that they will offend their customers if they associate their brands with sensitive subjects. And I wonder if we, nice church-going folks, tend to be the same way. But after Mr. Floyd died on May 31st in Minneapolis, a wide range of companies began to take much more public stances on racial injustice and police violence. Companies began to make the calculated decision to align their identity with values as a way to target certain audiences. When a company aligns its corporate values with what customers care about, the company hopes to build a sense of loyalty and a deeper sense of personal connection. Companies attempt to make a statement because it's moral. 
but also because they understand the long-term economic gain. They have a vested interest to gain more customers or build brand loyalty. So there's some incentive, if you will, for corporations to make a statement. And while I appreciate that my favorite sportswear and leisurewear apparel store made a statement, a statement is not enough. It's a big deal that a company is willing to risk a loss in their customer base and therefore in their profits for the sake of a statement. And even so, a statement is not enough. What incentive do you and I have to make a statement? And if we make a statement, there's the real possibility that perhaps a statement is not enough. Why make a statement if there's no potential economic benefit for you and me? Why make a statement if there's a Pandora's box or even more to follow after we take a risk and make a statement? It's like opening up a can of worms. What really could we gain if we started small, started with a small thing like a statement, and yet, we know that ultimately, it's not just enough to start. What companies and organizations did to make a statement after the death of George Floyd is indeed hard work. I do not want to minimize the hard work that goes into crafting the right words to both acknowledge the pain and move forward to healing, hope, and reconciliation. It's hard work. And yet, to craft a statement is not enough. Our text points us to this today. We have five parables for our study this morning. One parable is often sufficient to ponder, to gain insight. So imagine how full five parables will feel as we dive into the text. The parables are similar and also different. The first parable you have likely heard before. The first parable is the parable of the mustard seed. The mustard seed is a story about something that is the smallest becoming the biggest. We can make the connection relatively easily. God does grand things with small beginnings. This parable helps us when we feel like we are the underdog. The first parable of the mustard seed helps us when we first start on a new journey. It's a parable that can give you a sense of perseverance when your spiritual journey seems to yield small results. This parable reminds you that many things start small and yet can end up big and grand. The second parable is about yeast and dough. I made two batches of cinnamon rolls for the first time during the pandemic because I had a lot more time on my hands. So I experienced firsthand this scientific phenomenon whereby a small amount of yeast causes a great big reaction in the flour and other ingredients of to yield an expanding dough. This parable is similar to the mustard seed parable. The idea that something small can yield great big results. Again, we are familiar with this concept. If we look throughout scripture, there are numerous examples where God uses something small for a grand or big purpose. For example, small David and big Goliath. Of course, the giant is expected to win, but because God, because God is on David's side, small David wins. The small Israelites were enslaved in a foreign land. To add to their smallness, they were on foot while the Egyptians, where the slave masters were at home. And to make their statue and size even bigger, they rode on chariots. The small Israelites were, supposed, were not supposed to escape, but yet they did. Small Bethlehem was too small to find on a big map. But... From small Bethlehem came the Son of God. They are all small, these heroes, these favored ones of God. The places where God shows up first. 
And in our parable, yet again, God uses the analogy of small size to communicate a profound truth. God can use any size, and often God chooses to use small or even the smallest to communicate great big truths. A statement is a small thing, and yet God can do something profound, meaningful, and even transformational with something small. So as soon as I say that a small thing like a statement is not enough, I introduce the tension that the small is still necessary, even while I know that ultimately it won't be enough. I say this because of the third and fourth parables. The next parables challenge us more. These parables move beyond the initial response, the initial small response, to further bigger actions. In both parables, what is found, what is discovered is so precious, the finder changes direction. The finder changes his or her life, changes all plans to establish his or her life around this precious discovery. It's a sense of abandonment of the old so as to embrace the new. It's not enough to simply hold on to the treasure It's not enough to simply hold on to the fine pearls. Instead, those who find it are compelled to have a bolder, more extravagant response. A response that is appropriate is to abandon everything for that one single purpose, the fine pearls. To unpack the metaphor, once we find the love and grace of God through Jesus Christ, the only appropriate response is to put all our faith into this one true God. The only appropriate response is to leave everything behind in pursuit of God's purpose, to be active participants in God's kingdom coming now as it is in heaven. To simply find the pearl is not enough. To simply hold on to the treasure is not enough. To know you are saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ is not enough. It's like a statement. It's not enough. An extravagant response is necessary. Perhaps the first two parables can guide us in what would be an appropriate response. Perhaps an extravagant response takes time. Perhaps we can start small in our response to the pearl, to the treasure. It's a small step in the right direction when a company makes a statement against racial injustice, police brutality, and systemic racism. It's a small thing. It's an appropriate start, a small start, and yet a statement is not enough. When I think of a small step, To start small, I think of the peaceful protests that I and perhaps you have participated in these past months. I think of the small steps as my signature on a petition that came into my inbox to change the name of my high school alma mater. I think of the small step to participate in structured conversations in my community about racism. All of these are small steps. They communicate, I believe in what I believe in, what I value, and these small steps are equivalent to the statement, which is not enough. It's a tension, a paradox that we find ourselves in. Intentions and paradox, they are part of a spiritual life. In the same way that we are both sinners and saints, we need both baptism and communion, We both are compelled to do what is righteous, and yet we fail to do so. This is the tension that we are perpetually in, and this is the tension of our current landscape. The tension to start small, to do something like make a statement, and yet a statement is not enough. Just like these second set of parables, to find the pearl or treasure is a great first step. To find the love and grace of God is a great first step, but it's not enough. I'm personally exhausted from COVID-19 and the racial things that are going on in our country as the protests continue. I say I'm exhausted since I want to be honest and claim where I am. 
I work at Parkland Hospital, and our COVID numbers are simply not decreasing. Everywhere I turn, there's a persistent sense of anxiety and uncertainty. I want to do something. So I do something small. I make a statement. Occasionally, I make a post on social media, on social media that alleviates my sense of responsibility for a short amount of time, and then I'm convicted. A statement is not enough. Just like this parable shows those who find the gospel are compelled to do more, to respond lavishly with more than a statement, I too feel convicted to respond. I have to find my response, and I invite you into that conviction too. This space where you are compelled to do more. This space whereby you realize your statements are helpful, are needed, meaningful, and yet a statement is not enough. It is not enough to find the treasure or to find the pearl. An extravagant response is required. The final parable has similarities to the prior parables. The tensions are not resolved with a new idea in this final parable. It's the same idea, just stated a little differently. The final parable is clear. There is a separation between the good and the bad. There is a separation between the wicked and the righteous. Where do we fit into this parable? I don't believe we are ever considered bad and out of fellowship with our Creator, but I do believe God requires our behavior to be congruent with our spiritual identity and heritage. We don't have to make a choice about our goodness or badness. We are good and indeed God's children. But we do have to make a choice about how we respond to the knowledge of our identity. We have a choice to make about how we respond beyond a statement. In short, a statement that we belong to God is not enough. A statement about our convictions are needed and good, and yet our actions must follow. What are your statements? Have you made any? And if not, what keeps you from that small first step? God can do something grand and big with your first small step, which is a statement. Your statements are needed. We need statements everywhere. Not just because of the racial inequalities that are front and center in our nation today. We need statements of hope in the midst of our economic uncertainty. We need statements of faith in the midst of a public health crisis. We need statements of compassion. We need statements of grace and mercy, not judgment and condemnation. Where can you make your statements? Your statements are needed at home. Statements like, I love you. Statements like, we have a good life together. Statements like, you are a big help to me. Statements like, we need to think and even change how we speak about racial differences. Our statements matter. Your statements are needed at work. Statements like, I appreciate your hard work. Statements like, I couldn't do this without you. Statements like, I'm sorry. I didn't consider how painful police brutality might be for you and your family. If we all make statements, our statements will add up. And we need statements at church. Statements like, we are so blessed to be together, even if it's different than we're accustomed to. Statements like, the body of Christ doesn't necessarily look like we've always thought. Statements like, my biases have kept me from considering that God uses all kinds of people to accomplish God's will. Make your statement, and then know that a statement is not enough. Go and do more. May it be so. Amen.
take my life and let it be given. God, take great and Lord to Thee. Take my moments and my days. Let them flow in ceaseless praise. Let them flow in ceaseless praise. Take my hands and let them move at the impulse of thy love. Take my feet and let them be swift and beautiful for thee, swift and beautiful for thee. Take my voice and let me sing always only for my King. Take my lips and let them be filled with messages from Thee, filled with messages from Thee. Take my silver and my gold, not a mite would I withhold. Take my intellect and use every power as thou shalt choose, every power as thou shalt choose. If you would like to invest in this faith community and in its ongoing work of peace, love, justice, and freedom, the details will be on your screen in a moment. Thank you for being the Church of Jesus Christ, and thank you for supporting the work of Christ in this church. Let us pray. God who speaks to us in parables and who speaks to us plainly, we hear you speak to us through the parables Jesus taught. We struggle with the challenge that Jesus lays before us, the challenge to make a statement and yet to do more. We prefer to remain comfortable and simply do something small, if at all, and yet you call us to places of discomfort. You call us to do something small, like make a statement to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ, not only with our voices, but with our bodies, with our very lives. Help us to find the small statements we can make today and every day. Teach us not to shun small beginnings and to also live in the tension that though the beginning may be small with you, we will move beyond small beginnings. You are not a small God. You are a big and powerful God who comes to us in many ways. Bless our efforts and remind us again and again that you are with us through the power of the Holy Spirit. Our prayers are not only for ourselves today as we endeavor to change the church, our nation, and our world. Our prayers are for those who are seemingly forgotten. We remember those who are sick today, those who are isolated, those who suffer violence, we remember those who are without jobs or income. We remember those who are grieving and who feel lonely. You are a God who hears our prayers and therefore we make our requests known to you. All these things we are bold to pray 
and we expect to see how the Holy Spirit will move in our lives. Send us out, Lord God, confident that your kingdom is indeed coming, we pray. In the name of Jesus, who taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Following the benediction, I invite you to share the peace of Christ with one another during the postlude music by posting a message on our Facebook feed. Receive now the benediction. May the beauty of God be reflected in your eyes, the love of God be reflected in your hands, the wisdom of God be reflected in your words, and the knowledge of God flow from your hearts that all might see, and in seeing, believe. Amen. Amen.